Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I have the great pleasure of being joined by my colleague, Dr. Omar Abu Ezzedin, expert in uh, circulatory failure, as well as imaging, as well as uh, cardiac sarcoid and amyloidosis. Omar, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Dr. Friedman. Um, one of the things that's been really remarkable is the capability of advanced nuclear imaging to help us diagnose heart disease, manage heart disease, in a way that before really almost always required bits of heart tissue, which are hard to get, or other uh, more complex or less effective imaging approaches. So I'd like to focus on that today. And maybe I'll simply start uh, with first sarcoidosis and sarcoid heart disease. Um, explain the rationale behind using PET imaging to assess for cardiac sarcoidosis. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. And uh, I'm going to start off just with a very brief in introduction about sarcoidosis. It's, it's a system inflammatory granulomatous disease that can affect any organ in the body. Obviously, in this circumstance, we're interested in the heart. Now, when it infiltrates the heart, um, it does so in a very patchy manner, and it can be across any depth of the myocardium sometimes epi, sub-epi, and mid uh, myocardial. So as you can imagine, biopsy, even if it was voltage-gated, which improves yield somewhat, could be very problematic in that you have a very low yield of capturing those granulomas, those inflammatory um, granulomas. And so um, here comes in nuclear imaging. And, and the rationale behind PET imaging is using, because of the active inflammatory lesions that are very rich in macrophages, uh, which have a very high metabolism and tend to use a lot of glucose, we're able to use glucose-based um, F18 radio tracers that are labeled with F18. And um, once we do so, uh, granted, we try to suppress normal myocardial utilization of sugar. So if we suppress the myocardial's physiologic use of glucose and we use this radio tracer, uh, we believe we are able to image inflammation. In addition to the, um, the uh, imaging of FDG, we also tend to concomitantly image with perfusion tracers, be they rubidium or ammonium. Um, and the reason behind that is we believe when there's inflammation, when there's these non-caseating granulomas, you have microvascular inflammation and edema that causes concomitant hypoperfusion. So now you're imaging with an inflammatory radio tracer and a perfusion radio tracer. And if you see that you have uh, an increase in the inflammatory signal and a decrease in the perfusion signal, we believe that reflects inflammation of the myocardium, particularly if it's in a non-coronary distribution. Now, there are some caveats to this imaging. Um, hibernating myocardium could also show us a similar um, uh, presentation. It should, could also show us similar findings on PET imaging with perfusion abnormalities and high FDG uh, uptake. And so it's very important that we rule out all the common things such as coronary artery disease before we go on and look for uh, sarcoid. Again, sarcoid tends to be in a non-coronary distribution, but still uh, one of the limitations of the study is that you need to, or not limitations, but one of the caveats is you need to have ruled out coronary disease. And then the other thing is, like I said, the myocardium normally uses sugar, normally uses glucose physiologically. And so to really capture uh, inflammation, if you want, you need to suppress that physiologic uptake. And to do so, there's a few ways that have been uh, established the one that we use here mostly at Mayo is a high fat, low, and actually no carbohydrate ketogenic diet the day before, um, whereby we ask patients to eat at least two uh, uh, maybe, uh, or to three meals that are high, high in fat without any carbohydrates um, uh, for one to two days prior to imaging. 
and not to exercise whatsoever because exercising would promote uh, myocardial glucose uh, utilization. And so with this PrEP, we have found very good myocardial uh, physiologic suppression of glucose activity, which really um, increases, if you want, the specificity of the FDG signal for inflammation. So to summarize, we, we ask the patients to prepare the diet, which is extremely important to minimize false positives. We image with an F18 glucose uh, radio tracer and a perfusion radio tracer. And when you have a uh, mismatch or hypoperfusion and increased FDG signal in a non coronary distribution, that's rather specific for inflammation. No, thank you. Uh, um, really excellent explanation. Now, um, you and I really have talked in the past about when to suspect cardiac sarcoid, but I feel any conversation about it is incomplete because my next question will be, is extra cardiac or whole body imaging necessary to establish a diagnosis? But before you jump into that, maybe just very briefly to remind people, when do you think about it? When are you worried about cardiac sarcoid? So cardiac sarcoid, obviously, is we need to remember, uh, it still remains a rare diagnosis. Uh, despite our increased um, uh, diagnostic capabilities in the current era. Typically, um, uh, patients uh, present either with um, heart block or ventricular arrhythmias uh, or even heart failure um, in the advanced stages. So if uh, you're seeing a young patient with unexplained heart block after you've ruled out the more common things, um, you think of something like sarcoid. If they present with ventricular arrhythmias, if they present with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, these are all reasons to think of cardiac sarcoid, particularly in patients who have an autoimmune predisposition. So if they have other autoimmune diseases in themselves and in the family, as well as an environmental exposure. So we believe that um, a respiratory exposure triggers this reaction in someone who is predisposed to it. But we always need to remember it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you really need to think of all the more common things, exclude them before diving into a workup for sarcoid. Sure, and now that we're diving in, do you need um, the whole body imaging? <laughs> Um, we find it extremely useful as a first step in the diagnosis. So we don't think you need to always do whole body imaging, but if you are considering the diagnosis, it's rather important to see if you have extra cardiac disease, because if you have extra cardiac foci of increased FDG avidity or increased glucose uptake, uh, particularly with... Um, um, uh, the, you know, mediastinal uh, adenopathy, hyaluronopathy, uh, liver involvement, spleen involvement, uh, inguinal lymph node involvement. Um, that really offers us a, um, uh, a target for biops, because as we've, I've shared earlier, it's very hard to, you know, very rare, uh, you know, uh, to target or to be able to capture the granulomas when you do an endomyocardial biopsy. So it's much easier if you find an extra cardiac source to go after that. And once you have that path, you know, uh, uh, pathology, um, then in combination with the cardiac presentation and cardiac imaging, which has made their PET imaging, which has made its way into these diagnostic criteria, uh, for example, the HRS uh, diagnostic criteria, then that really increases our confidence in this diagnosis because it's a diagnosis that we need to make sure is accurate. I mean, we are, we're, um, you know, uh, it's basically a, a immunosuppression, transplant level immunosuppression for some very young patients. So it's not without uh, risk. And so um, you really need to make sure that you have all the things that, you know, you know, as many things as you can that support this diagnosis, including extra cardiac tissue. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, as, as striking as many of the advances in nuclear cardiology are, of course, MR has demonstrated remarkable capabilities for imaging all parts of the body, including the heart now. Um, how would you compare the two? When would you get one versus the other? And is there a role for hybrid imaging? 
Yeah, uh, excellent question. I think MRI is brilliant. It's a great modality, which we're increasingly using in uh, cardiomyopathies because it gives us a very nice um, assessment of myocardial morphology, function, even valvular disease. Uh, and it gives us information on um, whether there's late gadolinium enhancement, which suggests some form of fibrosis scar, uh, or even inflammation can also present that way. So the, the limitations, however, of MRI and the one-up, if you want, that PET has over MRI is not only does PET show you scar, but it can also decipher scar versus inflammation which on MRI in the current era, we're not able to confidently do that. Now there are um, MRI technology, as you can imagine, is, is uh, advancing very quickly. And T2 imaging is, is uh, if you want, there are edema sequences that show that we think reflect um, inflammation, but still with late GAD enhancement, which is what you know uh, most people um, uh, 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 capture with MRI imaging, you can't decipher the difference between scar and inflammation or fibrosis and inflammation. The other thing is um, uh, disease activity. So PET imaging will tell you there's active inflammation. PET, PET imaging will allow you to quantify this inflammation, which MRI doesn't necessarily do so. PET imaging allows you to monitor disease progression and therapeutic response, which again is very challenging um, with MRI. As we talked about, PET imaging of the whole body shows you extra cardiac, um, um, uh, extra cardiac um, uh, involvement. Uh, and also it offers prognostic uh, data, which uh, one would argue uh, MRI does uh, as well. Now the limitations of MRI beyond what I had mentioned also is a lot of these patients have devices. A lot of these patients have uh, kidney dysfunction. You know, they have advanced kidney disease. And so obviously these are both very problematic when it comes to MRI imaging. So uh, to summarize, I, I do believe that PET imaging um, particularly in the diagnosis and therapeutic response of sarcoid is superior to MRI. Now, all that being said, I think the future is going to be a future of hybrid imaging, where you have PET MRI hybrid imaging, imaging and we're already seeing that now. Now, there are some limitations when it comes to the magnet and when it comes to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, respiratory artifacts and, and things like this and gating difficulties, obviously, with MRI. Um, if someone has, uh, you know, uh, atrial fibrillation or, or, or ventricular arrhythmias, PVCs, whatnot. So, so we still are working through these uh, limitations, but I do strongly believe that the future is that of hybrid imaging like PET and MRI. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, you touch on an important issue, and that is patients with implanted devices. And as you're aware, I think it's just worth mentioning for our, our listeners that um, they cause artifact, although wideband filtering may mitigate that artifact. But, um, and some most currently manufactured devices are MRI conditional, meaning they can undergo imaging with FDA approval under certain pre-specified conditions, typically a 1.5 Tesla magnet and other sorts of things. Although in our own practice, we have developed working with radiology and physicists protocols where we scan thousands of people with non-conditional magnets. So when that image modality is important, it's not excluded by the presence of a device. Having covered all that, uh, an area of great interest for me personally, and so many of us now, is artificial intelligence. Uh, and as, as you know, um, many of us have done a lot of work using convolutional neural networks to identify patterns in the data that may be able to see things that are subtle, that humans have a hard time finding sometimes. Do you see there's a role for that now with PET imaging? Absolutely. I, I do believe that uh, strongly. The only limitation, I think, um, is the difficulty with, uh, you know, uh, the, the diagnosis being 100% proven that this is sarcoid. You know, it's not like uh, in amyloid or in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or systolic dysfunction. You have, uh, you know, uh, a zero one, definitely you have a diagnosis or you don't. There is a gray area in 
the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, where we we believe it is, but we're not, you know, so that may limit the neural network a bit. Um, but absolutely, I do believe that there are certain characteristics on PET imaging and the retention indices that we that are not visible to the human eye in a pattern that is not visible to the human eye, which in combination with ECG, which I know you've you've worked uh, a lot on uh, the AI ECG model, Dr. Friedman, I think the combination of those two, I think it's not going to be PET on its own AI, but it's going to be a combination of multimodality imaging, ECG, uh, and clinical presentation. But absolutely, I think that there is a role and we haven't scratched the surface yet of yeah. AI. I, I think it's very, I agree with you. I think it's very exciting. As with any th test, we have to test it, vet it, validate it. I was struck by some findings in radiology where they've developed an AI tool that identifies early pancreatic cancers that are missed by nearly all radiologists with a high specificity. But again, all these things have to be tested prospectively, but it, it is an exciting uh, time. Yeah, well, uh, Omar, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating space. Absolutely. It's so important and we look forward to continued advance in the field. Thank you for taking the time to discuss it with me today. Thanks, Dr. Friedman, a pleasure being with you.